controversy. Hello, welcome to Catalyst. The Academy Award-winning movie Finding Nemo took a little animated fish and made him a superstar. Tonight, reporter Richard Smith sets out to discover if there's any scientific truth to Nemo's extraordinary tale. What do you think you're doing? Get back here! Remember this little guy? If you put one fin on that boat, are you listening to me? Don't touch the boat. Nemo! Finding Nemo was the animation hit of 2003. Right. You were in big trouble, young man. Do you hear me? It was the story of a little clownfish plucked from his home on the Great Barrier Reef and rescued by his father after an epic trip down the east coast of Australia to Sydney. Nemo! Nemo! The film set a new standard for animation. It also hit the mark with Australian marine biologists studying the real life adventures of Nemo's fishy friends. Well, I think a lot of marine biologists were uh, quite excited to watch the Nemo film, actually. Obviously, someone had done their homework. They'd uh, talked about the movement of tropical fishes into temperate waters, which is something that we're looking at. Perhaps surprisingly for a Hollywood movie, there's a remarkable degree of scientific truth to the Nemo storyline. And then we go out and back in. And then one more time, out Not the talking animals, of course but the basic premise of fish on the Great Barrier Reef hitching a ride south of the border. Hey, they know Sydney. <gasps> you wouldn't know how to get there, would you? What you want to do is follow the EAC. That's a uh, East Australian current. Big current, can't miss it. It's in that direction. The EAC starts in North Queensland and then sweeps down the Barrier Reef every second carrying up to 30 million cubic metres of warm tropical seawater southwards at speeds of up to four knots. Of course, fish don't choose to ride the current. It's just something that happens. By early summer, most fish on the reef are busily making babies. Millions of them are cast adrift into the blue. Unlike many of his neighbours, a clownfish father will protect his eggs, but only until they hatch. If you look closely at the eggs, you can see the little embryos forming. First thing you'll see is the, the silvery eyes, and then they'll erupt clear and the larvae presumably get swept offshore. Countless young reef fish begin a perilous journey out beyond the reef. Many will make their way back to the coral after a few weeks in the plankton. But every year, some unwitting adventurers end up having the ride of their lives on the EAC. OK, grab shell, dude! Grab me! Exactly what these tiny fish are doing while out to sea remains a mystery. Although no bigger than fingernails, it would probably be wrong to assume they're simply swept along by the current, as we know they can swim strongly by themselves. But somehow, shortly after Christmas, they start popping up in Sydney Harbour. Look! Sydney. Sydney! Ah, uh, Sydney! Uh, Sydney again! Right, Dory, we made it! Up to 80 species of Nemo's tiny tropical friends, even a rare clownfish or two, have now been spotted in Sydney. Certainly, there's a suite of tropical fish that make it every year, particularly in the first half of the year, into Sydney Harbour and even a lot further south. These are accidental tourists. Tropical vagrants arriving as a result of an ancient evolutionary strategy. So, it is, so that is definitely a good sight. This humanity is here. By allowing their offspring to drift away from home, 
fish populations can spread to wherever changing climates and conditions allow them to survive. The sticky question, I suppose, is where have they come from? Have they come from the most southerly reefs, which might be, say, Coffs Harbour? Or have they come from the southern barrier reef or the northern or whatever? Part of the answer can be found in the fish themselves. Inside the ear canal of fish are tiny stones. These grow day by day. Put one of these weeny ear stones in an electron microscope and you can count the daily growth rate. So what you're seeing on the screen here is about a tenth the um, diameter of a pinhead. So it's you know, really expanded out. Each one of these concentric rings represents a day in the life of the fish. If you know how old an animal is, you know what its growth rate is and potentially, if it's drifting, where it's come from. Most fish arriving in Sydney have spent 20 to 30 days at sea. Even assuming a simple drift in the current, some fish have probably travelled up to 1,500 kilometres. Proof that it's possible for them to make it from the barrier reef to the bright lights of the big smoke. But just how far south can these small fish hitch a ride? Focus on the road. It's time to hit the road. Adventure naturally, that's us. The East Australian current continues down towards Tasmania, peeling off into large warm eddies which can lick in towards the coast. The eddies bring fish larvae in with them. Oh, I got it, I got it. <laughs> Eventually, near the New South Wales Victorian border, the larvae reach the end of the road. One of the hot spots, as we call them, is just inside Rumula Lakes. For some reason, they're getting off the bus there, you might say. My suspicion is that, especially in April and May, fairly warm plumes of water come out of Rumula Lakes, so there's a good chance that they're actually swimming to those. It's no surprise, really. They head in looking for the perfect coastal real estate. Somewhere warm, sheltered, and with enough rocky reef to substitute for the coral one they left behind. They're looking for a home away from home. The little dark one is a little du a baby dusky as well. It's a larger dusky. It's a very big topic in marine ecology in general, how populations are connected, and that has implications for marine reserves and also our understanding of marine fish populations. This, these are fish that have, I suppose you could say, lost their way. So I guess this is the extreme. Unfortunately there isn't a happy Hollywood ending for these small lost souls. A few will end up in fish tanks like Nemo himself. A very few will manage to survive to adulthood. But by far the majority will die during the first cold snap of winter. But their big adventures are teaching us something quite important about how wonderfully interconnected the oceans really are. And yet another shopping trip.